Hello to everyone again. Um, we'll just start in a minute or two. We've still got some delegates joining, so bear with us and we'll get started very soon. Right, I think we're almost ready to go. Um, I'm trying to just to let you know that I'm trying to turn on my video, but unfortunately it's not working, but you can all hear me. So that's the, that's the main thing. Um, we'll, I think, get going. We've got a, still got a few people joining, um, but we don't wanna go over schedule. So, Thank you very much for joining today's session. Um, really appreciate you attending today. Um, my name is Louisa Corsi and I am a business support partner here at Zero Waste Scotland. Uh, and today's session um, is about a certain type of circular business model. So in this case, product as a service. Uh, and this is one of nine business model strategies uh, that Zero Waste Scotland has identified um, that businesses can pursue in order to be more circular. Um, a little bit about Zero Waste Scotland. Um, if you haven't heard of us or engaged with us previously, uh, we are a not-for-profit environmental organisation funded by the Scottish Government and we exist to lead Scotland to use products and resources more responsibly focusing on where we can have the greatest impact on climate change. So by using evidence and insight, our goal is to inform policy and motivate individuals and businesses to embrace the environmental, economic and social benefits of a circular economy. So I just wanted to, to kickstart the session by actually explaining what we mean by the circular economy. Obviously, there are a lot of different phrases used at the moment with regards to sustainable development, um, the green movement, net zero, uh, carbon neutral, um, and they all mean slightly different things. So with regards to circular economy, um, it's, a, it's a systematic shift in the way that we think about and the way that we design products. So it follows three certain principles. It's about designing out waste and pollution, about regenerating natural systems and about keeping products and materials in use for as long as possible. Uh, this diagram here um, is a really useful way of explaining what we mean by the circular economy. It's quite a sort of a simple um, a visual representation. So since the industrial revolution, we've followed the linear economy. Uh, and this is one where we make, use, and ultimately dispose of items. Uh, the recycling economy is one that we followed for the past few decades. Um, it's been, you know, great developments in the recycling economy uh, where we try and extract value from those materials that we've used. But in a lot of cases, and has been highlighted recently, a lot of these are still sort of single use items. And ultimately, the value of, of, of that material is, is decreasing. What we're looking to do with the circular economy is circulate those materials and those products again and again and again for as long as possible. So you're entirely cutting out the concept of waste. And product as a service is one of the models that has been identified as an opportunity to recirculate those products and increase the, the, the value of the materials that we use. So that's what we're going to be talking about in more detail today. So our agenda 
Um, we have some fantastic speakers lined up today. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from Jess Twemlow. She's Associate Director for Circular Economy and Sustainability at Ricardo um, and has great experience in this particular sector. Then we're going to hear from three case study examples of Scottish businesses who have pursued this particular business model. So first of all, we're here from Je Jennifer Griffith, uh, product marketing team lead at Egg Lighting, and they sell the concept of lighting as a service. Then we'll hear from Naomi Ross, managing director at Shida, and they are a clothing rental company based in Stirling. And then finally, we're here from Victoria Thompson, who is co-founder of Parent, which is a new app allowing consumers to rent their their own products to other neighbors uh, and people in the community so we'll finish off with a q a session and then we'll aim to close at around 3 30. so just covering off a very quick bit of housekeeping just to note that um, all delegates have their videos and microphones turned off so if you do have any questions for our panelists um, please ask them via the chat function I'll keep an eye on the chat and then I'll pose these questions to our panelists at the end of the session. So please do ask questions. This is a great opportunity to, to pick their brains. Um, so yes, make, make, make the most of this opportunity. Also to note that the webinar is being recorded and will become a permanent resource on the Zero Waste Scotland website. So yeah, don't raise anything or put anything into the chat that you wouldn't want to have shared at a later date. So I think that covers everything for the introduction. So I'm now going to pass on to Jess to provide us with a, a bit of a, an introductory session to product as a service. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I think I'm struggling to uh, share my video as well. Um, so you will just have to imagine you can see me. Uh, if I can hopefully share my screen and the technology is working, you should be able to see it there. So um, yeah, I'm Jess Twemlow and I'm an Associate Director and I'm Head of Circular Economy at Ricardo Energy and Environment. So we're a sustainability consultancy and we're working to create practical and scalable solutions that directly support organisations in moving towards a more sustainable future. So I've been working in the sustainability industry for almost 20 years now. Um, and at Ricardo, over the last about five years, we've supported around 150 businesses in developing their more circular products and services. We're also one of Zero Waste Scotland's framework contractors on their circular economy business support programme. So we've worked with Zero Waste Scotland to deliver tailored circular economy consultancy directly to SMEs in Scotland. And we have worked with a number of businesses in Scotland and further afield who are developing product as a service offerings. Um, so I'm going to explain what product as a service actually is, um, what are the benefits to the customer um, and the business, um, what are the key challenges that you need to consider, but also looking at kind of what those opportunities are as well. And I'm going to finish by sharing some of the learnings um, that we've taken from supporting businesses when developing this model. You know, what does it mean for your business? And what are some of the key characteristics of a good product as a service model that will hopefully start to give you some ideas around how it might apply to your business? So if we start off, if I can move forward, brilliant. Um, what is product as a service? So I think the key thing to remember here is that products can have multiple life cycles. So in a linear supply chain, the economy uh, follows a take, make, waste approach. So commodities are extracted from the earth, they're processed, they're assembled, and then they're sold to the market. After the sale, the manufacturer loses control over the product, and the product is eventually going to be disposed of. There's a lack of incentive to actually produce durable products. In contrast, manufacturers are incentivized to produce products which are only going to last a short period of time in order to increase their recurring sales. So on screen is an example of a product as a service circular supply chain where the example shows there's the role of the retailer um, and it's there replaced by a service provider. So instead of paying for ownership of a product in a product as a service business model, the customer pays for access to the product and for any additional services in return for a reoccurring service free. 
I think in contrast to a for sale business model in a product as a service business model, um, the provider retains ownership of the product. So therefore they're incentivized to create value by offering high quality durable products that can be easily upgraded, uh, repaired, refurbished, and then can be taken back at the end of their useful life. I think where we've traditionally focused on selling the maximum number of products, the product as a service business model provides the same products, but to the maximum number of people over and over again. So the model includes leasing and renting and pay for use agreements. It allows customers to purchase a service or a desired result rather than buying the product itself. And I think product as a service, that model exists all around us already. You know, thinking about any time you've paid to use the product instead of buying the product itself. You know, whether you're leasing and renting a car or renting tools for a defined period or companies leasing printers and copiers. In each of these examples, the business is actually selling services or outcomes instead of an actual product. So they're not selling a car, they're selling transportation services. They're not selling you a pressure washer, they're selling you clean decking. They're not selling you a copier, they're selling you the copies themselves. The company that would have normally sold you a product is now selling you access to that product whilst maintaining ultimate responsibility for it. And so what are the benefits? Number of benefits to the customer, the business and the environment. So just to kind of summarize them here. So the primary benefit to the customer is they don't need to purchase and maintain the product or the appliance, and they have access to a wider range of choices for the value they receive. For example, a subscription could assure certain outcomes, um, such as guaranteed hours of uptime or include specific maintenance or repair services, if the customer thinks that those benefits are valuable. I think for a business, the model increases your profits because it decreases the cost of production. Fewer products need to be reproduced, but the products that are produced are going to be used over and over again. And that's providing a consistent revenue stream instead of a one time sale. And I think you're also developing a better, more valued relationship with your customer as well. And for the environment under this model, the resources that go into the products are better utilized and the products themselves are used optimally. So when they're used, they're used when they're actually needed rather than sitting and waiting for sporadic usage just by one owner. And the result is the demand for new products is reduced. So that's lowering our dependence on the Earth's limited resources. So now I wanted to talk about sort of some of the challenges that you need to consider for product as a service, um, but also looking at maybe what the opportunities are from that. There are many, um, but I've kind of listed the four that I see as the most important here. I think the quality of the product is key. Um, I think the challenge is that quality products require more investment. You know, during the design stage, you're having to think about how the product can be designed to be upgraded or repair, repaired or refurbished. You're thinking about the materials you're going to use to support longevity in your product. You know, you're thinking about how you can create a quality product that lasts. But there's also an opportunity there because high quality products are going to last longer and they're also going to improve your customer satisfaction. And within your subscription contract, you can include controls and penalties that protect you against the usual kind of wear and tear. I think the next area is customer service. I think the challenge is that customers want a convenient service that's designed with minimal hassle and simple payment terms. But again, I see that as an opportunity because, you know, excellent customer service and really good customer satisfaction is going to bring repeat business. Um, perhaps related to this is the value to the customer. So the customer requires a service that's going to be within their budget whilst delivering the required service. But again, that provides an opportunity because providing value for money and reducing the upfront payment by the customer is going to improve customer satisfaction. And finally, a real key consideration is the upfront investment that's required to retain ownership of a product. So product as a service requires pre-financing. 
you know, it's the number one reason why product as a service offerings scale slowly or cannot scale at all. You know, you need good financing or funding in place. You know, you need a clear plan of acquiring those finances. You know, that's so important. And I think financial organizations are getting better at looking at financing that's based on the value of the service contracts, that's looking at the credit worthiness of customers and the quality of the underlying assets, the underlying products. Um, okay, so next, I wanted to sort of look at what this actually means for your business. And I wanted to talk through some of the key learnings that we found from some of our work. And I think hopefully you'll see some of these come through when we have uh, the three case study examples later. So I think the first one is the customer always needs to come first. I think when you're offering product as a service, you have to have a real clear understanding of the people that want to buy your product. At the core, you're not offering your product, but you're offering kind of value and benefits to your customers with the product and any services that are connected to that. So you need to understand why your customers are buying your products. What do they want to get? And there'll be key reasons why people want to buy from you. And, you know, keep this in mind when showing the benefits to your customers. For example, you know, people don't want to plan their meals or go to the supermarket every week to kind of buy ingredients. You know, they don't have time or they feel they don't have the cooking skills. So they might prefer a food box to be delivered with a range of recipes and an explanation of how to cook that food. You know, HelloFresh is one of a, a number of companies that are kind of leading in delivering fresh recipes to customers on a subscription basis. I think the next one is keep in mind your pricing. Um, it's crucial that you've got a good revenue model. You know, what's the price you're going to charge your customers and how much do you need to earn over time to make your business sustainable? I think in a traditional model, it can be easier because the market dictates the price. But in a product as a service model, your price needs to be based on your customers, the type of customers you've got. It needs to be based on the market and it needs to be based on your product. So thinking about how many customers do you need or how many customers can you serve? Thinking about what is the product, but then what are those kind of extra services that you might actually offer your customers? And you also need to think about how you can scale over time. How many subscribers do you need to make a good profit? When you look at the business case, there's going to be an amount of subscribers at which the business becomes profitable. And I think for product as a service, it's really important to know how you're going to scale to that break even point. I think with product as a service, it's really common in the beginning, companies don't make that much money. You know, the profitability of a product as a service business often lies further down the line. And it's often then more profitable than a linear business model. And I think that organic growth to reach a solid subscriber base to make good profit can easily take a couple of years. So it's really thinking about that in your business plan. Um, I think further show the company benefits with products as a services. So consumers need to understand the benefits. You know, most customers are going to ask themselves, you know, why you instead of another company? And you need to acknowledge your value proposition. So what is it that makes your company unique? And then clearly show the benefits of your product as a service instead of actually buying that product outright. Why is it better than just owning the product? You know, what additional services are you going to add to the proposition that clients are going to value? Um, you know, are you going to provide a more premium product? Is it going to be more flexible? Is there the convenience? Are there other advantages? You know, are you promoting the sustainability benefits and what that actually means? And I think it finally is about having the right systems. This is really important. You know, you're going to need software to help you run the operational processes. How are you going to deliver the product? How are you going to capture your payments, start the billing, the logistics, the services, the return logistics? Um, and also, how can you use the kind of software to manage your customer relationships? And I think for most product as a service businesses, it's going to be really important to have a really good website or a really good app in which the, your customers can get that product as a service. You know, that front end website is your kind of billboard. It's your marketing tool that's going to allow you to showcase your product and share your value proposition. And then having a great website or a great app is then really a gateway to the sign up process in which you can turn that customer into a reoccurring relationship. 
And then finally, I just wanted to share some of the characteristics that we've seen as sort of good product as a service um, models. I think in almost every sector, you know, product as a service models are emerging and it's not just startups. I think really well established businesses are also reconsidering their business models and looking at how they can offer product as a service. So these are kind of just some of the characteristics that you might want to think about sort of within your organization. I think products with rapid technology developments, you know, by implementing a product as a service proposition in product types with rapid development, you know, providers, you can ensure that either the hardware or software is updated accordingly and the materials get reused. And then because the ownership of the product is going to remain with the provider, you know, there's no incentive for the customer to always buy the newest product as they get access to the latest developments anyway rather there's an incentive for the provider to upgrade or upgrade to the latest version um, to meet the needs of the customer um, I think uh, the next one is products that have got kind of a temporary use, you know products that are only used for a very short period quite often with a quite um, intensive usage, I think they can make really interesting product as a service offerings, because that temporary use can favour products like children's buggies or kind of children's clothing, you know, that they outgrow really quickly. Um, other examples can be, you know, equipment for people that are rehabilitating or temporary e-health appliances or holiday equipment or professional photography equipment. You can kind of see that kind of temporary of use there. The next one is luxury products. I think high end luxury products, you know, the products that many of us can't afford to buy outright also makes an interesting product as a service. You know, that might be fashion as a service. So thinking about a suit or a dress or jewelry or bags that you might want to just have for a special occasion like a wedding. Um, I think this is also a really great response to fast fashion because it's responding to the need of access and the continual freshness whilst increasing product lifespan. Um, I think another great example of this is um, BMW. They offer car as a service. So they offer kind of a luxury vehicle subscription by a month to month kind of membership. The next is supportive products. So products that provide convenience um, make quite an interesting characteristic. You know, consumers, we want to be unburdened from things like maintenance and repairs, and we don't want to be bothered by activities and tasks that we think are quite time consuming. Um, and often we're kind of less qualified to exercise to execute some of those activities than the service provider. So there's a company called Blue Movement that's sort of working with a number of kind of leading home appliance brands like Bosch and Siemens, and they offer a product as a service model. So instead of so they offer them as a service so they basically deliver the appliances install them repair them kind of pick the appliances up at the end of contract and the lifespan of the appliances is extended as the repair and maintenance is included as a part of that contract so the consumer doesn't need to worry about that um, caterpillar as well offer kind of machinery as a service components in which they can monitor the use of their products and provide feedback to customers on optimal usage but then they can also understand kind of the maintenance services that are needed or any repair services that are needed to lengthen the lifespan of that product and keep the performance over time. So then the business is sort of less worried about actually doing that themselves. Um, next is you need to have a product that fits minimum requirements of your customer. I think for some customers, a product has to meet certain requirements that they're going to base their decision on, you know, the minimum requirements that they're going to need to have for that product. You know, that's really going to differ between market and consumers. So looking into the general kind of trends within your market is really important and researching it before launching your product as a service is going to be a really huge advantage because you're going to find out which factors are essential and which aren't. Um, and you might be able to get rid of kind of unnecessary kind of features there as well. For example, I think for clothing rental, you know, it's being really clear on kind of the washing and cleaning process because hygiene is going to be so important and cleanliness around that. Or thinking about, you know, the minimal rental periods that people might want or the number of items that a customer might want as part of a subscription package or the postage and delivery options, including kind of the speed of shipment that you might need to consider, all thinking about how you make it as easy and as convenient as possible for customers. 
And finally, there's kind of smart integrated products. So I think products that are connected to the internet really have a competitive advantage with regard to product as a service. I think through data sharing, I think insights can be gathered on the product during the life cycle, you know, through the production, use, care, return, we say, or repair. You know, one example of a subscription model is HP's Instant Ink program. So they use smart technology that ensures the customers have ink when they need it, and then they can recycle use cartridges more responsibly. So through the program, sort of the internet connected printer notifies HP when the ink is running out. So then the, a customer is automatically delivered a replacement cartridge uh, and a sort of postage page envelope is then used for returning that cartridge back to HP. Um, so in summary, hopefully you've seen how you're or given you some ideas around why product as a service might be something you want to consider. Um, whilst, you know, it can still boost your profits and it can allow you to sort of generate a reoccurring revenue. Um, I think product as a service offerings are going to continue to grow um, with more adop adoption from customers and um, companies. So, you know, really consider how it might work with your organization. And I will stop sharing my screen. Great. So, Louisa. Thank you very much, Jess. That was that was really great. And I'm pleased to confirm that I think video is now working. So we are back online with video. There we go. Now you get to see <laughs> Jess, Hello, everyone. who was speaking at you all that time. Great stuff. No, thank you. That was a really, really useful introduction. And I think, yeah, provides a really clear overview of what we mean by product as a service. I think for everyone listening, it's a case of taking a, a step back from what it is they're manufacturing, what it is they're selling and what is it that your customers are ultimately looking for? What is that service provision and sort of stepping away from the material value and thinking of the, the end results? And I think starting from that end and working your way backwards really helps. Great. Well, moving on then, um, we will now pass on to um, Jennifer from Egg Lighting. Hi there. Um, Great stuff. And this is a, is a really innovative concept of a service as a lighting. So Jen, we'll pass over to you um, if you want to share your screen and I'll let you know if it's all looking good. Okay. Um, I think that... Oh. Share. Hopefully that should be us. Yep, great. Marvellous. All right, I'll take over. Thanks a lot for that, Louisa. Thank you. And you should be able to turn on your video as well, fingers crossed. Uh, that's far too much IT. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I think that should be me. Yep, Hi. there you are. <laughs> Hello. Um, all right, so I'll just uh, go ahead. Maham, I'm Jennifer. I'm responsible for the marketing strategy and implementation here at Egg Lighting. We are a uh, Business, business energy efficiency solutions provider specializing in sensors and LED lighting. We're made up of three main departments which are relevant to today's conversation. Uh, commercial lighting projects, circular economy services such as remanufacture, and in-house R&D department which uh, develops new hardware and software solutions which augment our product offering. Uh, to give you some context for our work, egg lighting do commercial and industrial uh, lighting projects in the public, public and private sectors. We deal mostly with building owners and facilities managers. It's been an exciting few years in egg. Our work in circular economy and research and development has led to a lot of success in industry awards. Um, so those three core services we offer, the commercial projects, circular service and tech functionality, they each come, they are each focused on an outcome. Broadly speaking, commercial projects, LEDs, save our customers a lot of money on their energy bills. Our circular services are all about reducing operational embodied carbon through remanufacture. Remanufacture, for those who aren't aware, is the process of repairing a product to 
to at least as new standard or even upgrading it with a full warranty to match. And tech functionality is all about optimizing a facility and installing technology that's non-proprietary, i.e. it doesn't lock you into one vendor. This gives customers confidence that they can access third-party innovations securely for years to come, whether or not they're an ongoing contract with us. So what is product as a service? First, we have to start with the circular economy. PASS comes under the umbrella of the circular economy, which as Louisa explained very eloquently, is essentially a guide to make business models which are better for businesses, society, and the environment. The idea of product as a service started in the software industry. It related to providing access to digital products, products that were never owned by the customer. Essentially, your bottom right yellow triangle there, ongoing services on a subscription model. But in hardware companies, products as a service has a much broader definition. The difference arises between owning physical goods and having access to ongoing services. That's those top two boxes there. Companies not in the software industry will typically be dealing with both. There is more upfront capital held in assets which are physically on a customer's premises and therefore the manufacturer is taking on more risk. Why take on that risk? Well, because it allows us to take more responsibility for the products that we make. Um, Jessica's talk went into this uh, area in much more detail, the logistics and challenges of building a products and service customer base. Um, but for us, servitization is a key enabler on the path to a viable circular economy business model. For us, it's because it creates a relationship with the customer and provides allows us to provide them with additional value. Those blue and green bars there, they're all added value services, but not all payment models can support them. If I have a relationship with my customer, I can spread out payment of assets over time. And if I, we integrate digital feedback, then it can provide insights to help them make more informed decisions on how to optimize their energy usage. It provides us with the confidence to retain ownership until the physical goods are paid off or to continue that ownership if the customer wants to go down that path with us and layer on additional services which a customer can choose to continue with because they've already experienced the enhanced value we are bringing to their business. So let's start off with an example here. Um, the year is 2012. William is the maintenance manager for a warehouse with a thousand lights. He upgrades the best LEDs on the market and because LEDs are just so much more efficient, he saves 40k a year on energy alone per year. Nice work, William. But there are two important concepts uh, I want to introduce you to. Hate's Law and L70 Racings. Hate's Law, that green line on the left is the increasing efficiency of LEDs over time. Actually, this is exactly one of the points Jess touched on, products with rapid technological developments. LEDs are one of those. Five years ago, um, 80 lumens per watt was a top of the market product. Today, 110 watts is quite common. The second factor, the orange line here on the left, is an L70 rating. Essentially, this is means the rated lifetime of a luminaire, it will decrease to 70% of its original lumen output. So if it's rated for five years, then the end of the five years, you're getting 30% less light at the same electricity consumption as you did when they were first installed. So it's five years later, and uh, William has upgraded his energy efficiency by adding sensors. He knows he could save another 7K per year if he upgrades his LEDs again but he'd have to throw all of his old lights in the skip. You see, LEDs don't tend to be designed to facilitate replacement of light bulbs. When you replace an LED light, you replace the whole unit. So some facilities managers will choose to upgrade their operational carbon, um, electricity usage regardless. But of the 40,000 tonnes of new equipment added to the UK market each year, only around 6 per cent gets recycled via a certified WE scheme. In this way, products without a service lock customers into stagnant technology. This gap shows the potential energy savings avail 
available in the market, which William cannot access without overhauling his entire existing lighting system. When William upgraded in 2012, he was set on a path of decay. He, was lo he is now locked into the technology that was available at the time that he upgraded his facility. The situation, this business model incentivizes material waste, aka embodied carbon, to maximize energy savings, that's operational carbon. Egg lighting provides an alternative. So, William phones Genevieve, uh, no relation, at egg lighting, and asks how he can minimize his material waste while maximizing his energy savings. She summarizes the problems that he faces. His LED lamps are no longer as efficient as they once were, and no longer meeting market-leading technology, meaning William is missing out on monetary and carbon savings. If he upgrades his lamps, he's signing away two tons of mixed we to recycling or landfill. His supply chain and stock management system is getting more complex. It's difficult to predict facility usage and schedule required maintenance. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So, by creating a service relationship with the customer, we can extend the useful life of our products at market leading increasing efficiency for 25 years. Each one of those blue steps is us remanufacturing a customer's lights. That represents five opportunity upgrade efficiency to the latest available on the market, five times that you don't have to buy new replacement lights and five times less waste sent to landfill. Egg lighting can halt the depreciation of William's lights, upgrade the efficiency, and divert 95% of the material from landfill. So what does a model, a uh, pass model look like? Every five years, we come into your uh, facility and take out the old lights. We remanufacture to retain the material at its highest value. We clean the components, upgrade them to the latest available on the market, test them, and produce documentation to ensure compliance with UKCA regulations, then reinstall the new products in your facility. We aim to remanufacture a customer's existing lights, but not all customers can be, be not all luminaires can be remanufactured economically, so we also supply new lights which have been designed to facilitate the remanufacture process. The benefits of this are it creates high quality skilled jobs right in the heart of Glasgow, it reduces the embodied carbon inherent in creating new products and transporting raw materials internationally, and makes our local supply chains more resilient because we source more materials from local businesses. But while we're remanufacturing and upgrading the energy efficiency of the year lights, we can also incorporate the latest smart technology. Uh, another point uh, raised by Jessica's presentation, where real-time insights can be generated during the product's lifestyle, life cycle. I don't have time to go into all the benefits today, but one example is in a recent project that we did, saw us provide an integrated hardware and software solution. We developed a digital platform where they could view the status of their emergency lighting transposed over a layer of their facility. Uh, emergency lighting is a time and labour intensive process. Uh, National Association of Shop Fitters uh, report that over half of businesses are failing to keep up their 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 safety systems up to date. Our connected and automated services can help keep businesses compliant and in this case help keep people safe. So that takes me on to challenges and opportunities. Essentially for us, uh, PASS, uh, Product Service Lighting as a Service, is a journey. We want to provide fully subscribed goods and services, but it's a big change and we have to prove ourselves to each individual customer first and make sure that our services are a right fit for that customer. In a traditional direct sale model, I can save a customer thousands of pounds and lower their operational costs, but I can't predict their usage of that product, find out uh, which components have degraded or to what extent, or predict when the best time is to go in and upgrade that product. A five-year rolling contract gives me an ongoing relationship with the customer and it lets me offer zero upfront costs. The initial capital expenditure of a lighting project is a large barrier to some of our customers. They can start to offer proactive maintenance um, services such as remote emergency light testing, as in uh, my, my example earlier. But a subscription model helps the customer to access shorter-term investments. Bluetooth 
app functionality that allows control of your lights from your phone or notifications about movement detected on your facility out of hours. Bluetooth is the backbone of the IoT, the, the Internet of Things. Um, there, there are approximately already 2 billion IoT compatible devices on the market and more are being created every day. The market is currently estimated to be worth uh, almost 400 billion US dollars and set to grow to 2,000 billion in 2028 numbers. I don't even understand. That's all to say, Egg believes that giving your facility access to the IoT now with secure, non proprietary equipment opens up countless services in the future. So, we offer a range, uh, a flexible range of payment options and service levels that we hope will allow us to bring people on the journey towards full servitization with us. With that, I hope I've demonstrated today that products and services can be combined to different degrees. And while there's always hesitancy about doing something different, the challenge is not only worthwhile for businesses, society and the environment, but it provides value to both our businesses and customers. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please get in touch by the links below. Um, oh, and there's also a fabulous white paper on our website written by my colleague Tom Ruddle under the heading uh, uh, of Egg Circular, which will explain more about remanufacture, uh, what it is and its role within the lighting industry. All right, thanks a lot. Great, thank you so much, Jen. No, that's a that's a fantastic example, and I think really helps to illustrate that this concept can be applied to so many different industries. I mean, I think very few people would initially think that you could have lighting as a service. Um, I think as your presentation has has gone to show, it does incorporate so many of the things that Jess mentioned in terms of innovation and future proofing and and value for money. So that's really highlighted some some great benefits of that model. So. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Great. So moving on now um, to Naomi Ross from Shiva. Um, Naomi, would you like to share your screen and yeah, present to us? Sure. Thanks very much. Can you see that, Louisa? Yes, I can. That's great. Excellent. Okay. And um, so thanks very much for having me on. Um, as as Louisa said, my name is Naomi Ross and I'm the Managing Director for Shida, um, which is an online clothing rental service that offers high-end everyday and occasion wear for women in sizes 4 to 24 um, with brands like Reese Whistles, Ted Baker um, and specialist uh, brands that cater for petites, talls, plus sizes and um, as of next week, maternity and breastfeeding wear as well. Um, so as far as being a product as a service goes, what we're really offering is um, access to fashion um, in a way that is more sustainable than the kind of traditional uh, disposal fast fashion route that has really taken hold um, in the UK over the last few years. Um, we buy in all of our stuff from um, primarily secondhand places, um, so the stock's already um, you know, part of the, the circular economy and um, it's all really carefully selected to make sure that it's you know, pristine condition stuff that we're offering out um, and it really helps the customer to kind of know that what, what they're getting is um, genuinely going to be better for the environment. It's also an affordable service and um, we price ourselves to be able to compete with um, traditional retailers that our customers would be using so the likes of your Primark, New Look, um, Next, H&M but again obviously with the stock being um, much better quality stuff. Um, and probably most importantly, um, I think as Jesse kind of touched on, is the convenience side of things. So we really aimed to make our site as convenient as um, a, an alternative, a traditional um, e-commerce um, website. So you can see here on the, the slide, this is our website on a smartphone. It's smartphone adaptable, which means that our customers can browse on the go on their way to work or they can browse from the comfort of their sofa after a long day and um, the products are really really easy to order and they get delivered to the customer's house and picked up again at the end of the month so there's no need for the customers to have to make journeys to the post office unless that's what they prefer to do um, and we deal with all the laundry for them as well so that's one less thing for them to have to worry about 
So in terms of some of the challenges that we've had, um, I haven't got time to be able to list all of them. Um, as Jess was talking earlier, there were quite a few that she flagged up that I had completely forgotten about. Um, we've been going for the launch in December of 2020, and um, there's been a lot of highs and lows during that time, but I'll focus on um, the kind of key ones that, that come to mind for us. So um, first one really is identifying that target customer, which again has already been touched on. Obviously, everybody wears clothes. It would be really easy to kind of just try and be someone, you know, be a service that appeals to everybody. Um, but that really is kind of spreading yourself too thin. So our initial thought had been that we would focus on Gen Z, and that tends to be the kind of demographic that gets a lot of flack for its consumption of fast fashion. Um, but as we kind of worked through our business, we realized that the millennial um, women were really kind of the, the demographic that we knew and understood best. Um, and so they were probably the ones that we should be really focusing on. Um, and millennials are really kind of just as bad when it comes to overconsumption. They just do it in different ways. Um, so our main um, kind of woman that we're focused on, we call her Maggie. Um, she is a mum of two kind of quite young children and um, before she had the children she had a full-time career and she's probably working part-time now um, she is really social she loves spending time with her friends and family um, and as someone who has you know always really liked to kind of pay attention to the way that she looks since having her children she's lost a lot of self-confidence her body shape's changed um, and she's really kind of looking to get a sense of her own um, style and her own self and identity back again um, she has a lot less money now than she did before she was a mum, so being able to afford the clothes that she used to wear just isn't really an option anymore. And since she's had her children, she has started thinking a bit more about the world that she's brought them into and what their future is going to look like. So sustainability is something that she's starting to think about, but because that's not really her background, it's something that she finds quite overwhelming. She doesn't really know where to start. So for us being able to offer a sustainable service, it's something that she's you know, quite excited about um, and it's more of an icing on the cake thing rather than uh, a kind of key, um, key reason for using us. Um, COVID obviously has been a big challenge. Um, it would be remiss of us to ignore that. Um, as I say, we launched, we first started thinking about um, a clothing rental service in October of 2018. We launched in December 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic when nobody had any version of going to get dressed up. Um, so obviously our first year's revenues weren't quite what we were um, initially forecasting. However, um, the fact that we are not just focused on occasion wear and that we do every day wear was something that worked quite well in our favour. Um, we had a lot of people renting out coats for their, you know, their old daily walk outside, um, a lot of people renting tops for their Zoom meetings, um, and also you know, a lot of people put on weight during um, lockdown and being quite determined that that wasn't going to be a permanent state. We had a lot of people that were renting um, skirts and trousers and things to see them through that, um, that period. Um, we have been quite fortunate, I would say, in that we have kept all of our logistics in-house, so we haven't had an awful lot of overheads to have to deal with during the pandemic. Um, we have about 700 square foot within, um, within our home that's been given over to the business, and that covers warehousing, uh, product processing, and a photography studio as well, so we've managed to kind of really rein in our costs. Um, hygiene, again, something that's already been touched on. Before the pandemic, there were a lot of people who were you know, really quite kind of funny about wearing something that somebody else had already worn. And obviously that's really been exacerbated by the pandemic. So we've been really transparent about our laundering process. Um, and part of that includes the use of a steam sanitizing chamber by LG, which is certified to protect against a whole range of allergens and viruses, including coronavirus strains. Um, and so that's something that you know, we really kind of push to give people the reassurance that what they're getting is going to be safe. And also um, testimonials from customers that have used us um, have been really valuable at actually showing um, prospective customers that the stuff that they've received has been really good quality and really good condition and, and just giving people that confidence to try something new. Come on, direction there. Um, so how it works as well, um, again, because it's a completely new concept, sometimes it can take a lot of people um, you know, a while to understand, particularly with the returns side of things. 
Um, so we've put a lot of work into really making sure that we're as clear as possible about how the process works. And um, we've got a whole page on our website dedicated to that. Um, and you can see here that it's kept as kind of clean and clear as possible. And um, just six straightforward slides that talk about it with quite a lot of detail on the, the return process side of things. And as you say, with the returns, um, we, you know, we issue a um, email to our customers a few days before to remind them that the such due back so that they don't have to worry about forgetting and um, if they don't want to have the stuff collected from their house if that's not convenient for them then there is the option for them to drop it off at the local post office and um, we were just kind of trying to be as adaptable as possible to fit with what the customer needs to make the whole um, service as accessible and convenient as possible. Uh, ownership attachment, I think it was kind of touched on, um, definitely something that we um, have kind of seen as an issue. You know, there are certain products that people are quite used to renting, but clothing and consumer goods is, is quite new for a lot of folk. So what we really focused on here um, is uh, the benefits that rental can bring in terms of, you know, decluttering your house so you don't end up with an overstuffed wardrobe. Um, again, COVID has been quite helpful there as people have spent a lot of time in their house, you know, felt like they're quite claustrophobic, they've done a lot of spring cleaning and they don't want their homes to be recluttered again. Um, and another benefit as well with not committing to the clothing that you're um, that you're looking at is that you can be a lot more creative and um, you, know, you can try new styles, colours, brands that you maybe wouldn't otherwise have done if you were having to shell out a lot of money. Um, and with our service, you know, if you're renting four items at once and if three of them work for you and one of them doesn't, it's not really that, that big of a deal. Um, and we've had quite a lot of customers feedback to us that that's been something that they've really liked, you know, um, wouldn't try a a red dress usually but they felt amazing in it and it's giving them confidence to to try that again in the future that kind of thing uh, marketing obviously the fashion industry puts an insane amount of money into marketing and so for us just physically getting our name out there and under people's noses has been quite a challenge um i would say that the kind of key thing for us has been um now that we have a lot more content available as the, the year has gone on and um, switching to video based content rather than image based content because um, social media uh, algorithms prefer that and we'll, um, we'll put that content out further um, and also you know, we've done a lot of trial and error um, but what we've really found is that focusing on local and Scottish uh, marketing rather than UK wide has been um, really beneficial for us um, I think probably that's because a lot of people are really kind of getting into the idea of supporting local now and you know we're a lot more anonymous at the UK wide level whereas people really like the idea of supporting a, a local business. Inclusivity, um, another real challenge for us, we when we started this business we were very very kind of clear in our minds that the only way to really tackle the climate crisis was to make sustainable living as easy for as many people as possible um, and so making sure that that was factored into our service was really important to us and that's why we cater for the, the big size range that we do however that obviously comes with its challenges and um, Jeff mentioned you know the startup costs for um, for a lot of service businesses like these um, and a big part of that is about having a variety of stock so you know not everybody who decides can likes the same stuff um, and catering across a wide range of sizes and body shapes um, can be quite challenging especially with because um, with our stuff being primarily secondhand, uh, we find that a lot of the kind of mid-range sizes tend to be significantly cheaper to procure than the fringe sizes. So there can be a temptation there to, um, you know, go for those cheaper sizes so that you've got more range and possibly neglect the, the kind of fringe ones. And we've had to be really, really strict on that. Um, also, uh, just a really simple thing but actually listing the stock when it comes to inclusivity um, we list our products on real women and mannequins that are the size of the product so we don't list the size 18 product on a size 8 mannequin or a size 8 model because we want customers to have an idea of what the product's actually going to look like on them um, that is fine for the kind of standard sizes again but what we really struggled with is getting mannequins that um, are outside of the size 6 to size 20 range um, so we're fortunate that we have a, a good number of um, larger models that are happy to, to model for us but when it comes to putting stuff on the website um, we can't just stick it on a mannequin and, and then 
um, upload it, we actually have to wait. So um, it's really small things like that that, that can make a difference. Um, and also because we want to make sure that we're um, showcasing real women and the, the work that we do and that we're showcasing a diverse range of women, um, I'm sure that you know, it won't come as a surprise to a lot of you that Central Scotland and Stirling in particular is a very, very white community. Um, so that's something that we've struggled with. We haven't really found a silver bullet. We've just had to pay more money to get models that represent um, other ethnicities. Um, and finally, pricing. Um, again, we've been really kind of focused on making sure that it's as affordable as possible to as many people. Um, but with you know, business costs having increased significantly recently, we have had to put our prices up. Um, that was quite difficult for us to do, but we are still the best value rental and uh, COVID rental service in the UK. Um, couriering, we, when it came to who we were going to be using, we were quite aware that this was one of the biggest sources of emissions for us. Um, so we wanted to really focus on using a company that would um, mean less actual emissions rather than net emissions. Um, and for that reason, we went with Royal Mail. Um, they obviously are out and about on your street every day anyway. So if a customer is renting from us, they're not generating an additional journey above and beyond um, what's already out there. And the packaging as well, we had a lot of trial and error with that. The one that you're seeing on the left there is what we tried initially. A repack to a reusable packaging service, which is great and um, it kind of does the job, but we wanted our packaging to be um, aesthetically pleasing so that our customers are really excited when they open it. Again, you know, they're, they're customers that are used to consumer lifestyles and that's the kind of you know that is important to them. Um, and the repack stuff just wasn't quite doing it for us. Um, so we also tried these cardboard boxes, which were uh, made of recycled cardboard. They were a little bit on the flimsy side, and when the customers were receiving them, sometimes the boxes were quite bashed, and by the time they were getting back to us, um, they could be even worse. So what we've ended up settling on is the one on the right, which is by Daft Pack. It's a 75% recycled cardboard box that's manufactured here in the UK, so it has fewer air miles from its production. Um, and it's very, very sturdy. So although it's um, officially a single use box, as well as making the return journey back, we've actually been able to use these for three, sometimes four, um, four customer uses, just depending on you know, other factors like weather and all that kind of stuff. And finally, the box that's in the middle there is um, what we're kind of really aiming for. This is a, a reusable box made out of recycled plastic. Um, it's usable up to, uh, it's got a guaranteed minimum of 40 uses on it. There isn't anything like this in the UK at the moment. Um, we would have to be ordering this in from America, manufactured in China, and it has a minimum order quantity that's uh, quite significant as well. So that's what we're aiming for, um, and we're very much on the lookout for that in the UK, but uh, for now the Daft Pack boxes are doing this really nicely. And finally, funding. Um, again, as Jess had mentioned, the startup costs for these kind of businesses can be really, really expensive, um, and that's certainly no exception for us. Um, I think if you're a business, if you're an established business that's looking to kind of pivot to a more sustainable business model, there's a lot of financial support available for that. But when you're a new business with no track record of um, running a business, uh, we find that that was you know, a little bit trickier. So these here are just some of the examples of where we've managed to um, secure funding from. And then finally, we were asked to talk about um, any lessons learned. Um, and I think one for us really is the sustainability side of things. Um, although this was really important to us as a business in terms of how we run it, we were really keen initially to not put that out there as any kind of front and center thing because we thought it would be quite off-putting for our customers. And actually, we found quite the opposite. We found that people are really, really excited about the fact that they can enjoy fashion in a way that is better for the environment. And so we switch that and being uh, quite heavily focused on that. That in itself has brought some challenges because we need to be very, very careful about how we word things so that we're not straying into greenwashing. Um, we are quite conscious of the fact that we are not the ultimate sustainable option when it comes to your clothing. That's learning to love what you already have. Um, so we really talk about ourselves as being a, a step towards a more sustainable life. Um, and there's a whole load of other things that we do for our customers to help them um, find other ways of living more sustainably. Um, we've also had to defend ourselves more than we expected to. So the article on the right here was a piece that went out in The Guardian last year, uh, saying that you'd be as well just throwing your clothes in the bin rather than renting. Um, and that was extrapolated from a Scandinavian study. Um, the authors of which actually did come out and say that the 
the way that it had been portrayed in the media was quite um was, was quite wrong and didn't really factor in how narrow the study was. Um, and then the one on the left here, in contrast, um, is from the Scotsman, which um, has she's listed as one of the most environmentally friendly businesses in Scotland. So we're quite pleased to have that one featured. And that's everything from me. Um, here's our details if you're looking to either get in touch or want to go online and take a look at the rentals yourself. And I look forward to taking your questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Naomi. No, I think that's that's really interesting. And, and what you said about your target market, perhaps the fact that sustainability or circularity isn't necessarily one of the key drivers for your target market, but actually upon sort of going through more of a process and learning more, that has been a good marketing aspect for you. So yeah, it just goes to show the things that you, you learn on the journey. So thank you. And also, yeah, the, the packaging point as well, the fact that you're offering a, a circular product, but you're also looking at offering the circular packaging that, that goes with it. So yeah, it's really great that you're trying to do as much as you can. And I think that's really key because otherwise businesses could end up coming under criticism if you know they're not looking at all the different aspects of their business. So I think that's, that's really good advice. Thank you very much. Great. So we're now going to move on to our final speaker, um, this is Victoria from Parent. So I'm just going to share screens here. Okay. You're on you're on mute, Victoria. Um, but yeah, hopefully you can yeah. see the screen okay. Yep. <laughs> There we go. Um, sorry, everybody, I'm having um, slight tech technology issues today I and mean, my computer's not working. So Louisa has kindly offered to um, flip my slides for me. So thank you very much, Louisa. Um, and thank you um, for giving us the opportunity to, to speak with you all this afternoon. Um, have some difficult acts to, to follow there after um, Jess and Jennifer and Naomi, but we'll give it a go. Uh, so just by way of introduction, uh, I'm Victoria Thompson uh, and I'm co-founder of PayRent along with um, my friend and uh, former colleague Victoria Davidson um, who's, who's not with us today but um, PayRent, um, just to give you a bit of a, a, an, an overview, is a, an online family to family sharing platform and the way we describe it is like Airbnb, but for stuff. Um, and it's got, a, we kind of focus on the items for everyday family life use. And the purpose really of Parent is to um, allow people to create space. So they're not having to keep a carpet cleaner in their house if they can borrow it off one of their neighbor, neighbours. Um, to reduce waste um, and to, to help families make and to save money. Um, and I think if there's a time for something like this to work, it really is now where um, the, we were seeing the sort of the cost of items and the general cost of living um, rising exponentially. Um, uh, and we think something like this offers uh, a good way to access items um, cheaply. And it also gives people the opportunity to make money off of items that they're not using all that frequently. So um, this afternoon, I'm just going to go through the, the background to pay rent, explain to you how it all started and came about, um, what our purpose is, how the platform works, um, what our kind of first steps in getting set up were, what our next steps are, um, what key challenges we faced um, and what we're doing um, to sort of take the business further and then we'll sort of finish off with some top tips for anybody who's um, looking to start a product as a service business. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide. Um, so parent came about because uh, Victoria and I were on maternity leave together. Um, the other Victoria is based down in um, Leamington Spa at the moment uh, and we were both decluttering our houses and we'd speak on the phone every day and we were sort of talking about all these items that we had for um, our babies that we weren't necessarily ready to part with yet but that we were going to just be putting up the loft and that seemed like um, a real waste um, particularly when babies are in you know babies use items for such a short period of time so we kind of got to thinking is there a way that we could lend these items out to other people so that they could get use of them in the meantime and then it sort of occurred to us that um, 
there would be so many other households in the UK with the same um, scenario whereby they were essentially putting things up the loft um, that were sitting unused potentially for um, years to come. So we did a bit of market research. We we went out to um, a, a hundred mums in Edinburgh uh, and asked whether this was a service that they think they they would use if there was some kind of online platform where they could share and borrow items. Um, and uh, the, the, I think all but one came back and said yes, they would use it. Um, but what came out of that research was people saying, "Well, I would use it, but not necessarily for um, for my baby. I would use it for a carpet." Cleaner or I would use it to borrow a gazebo or I would use it to borrow a karaoke machine um, and it, it, it goes back to what sort of Jess was talking about at the beginning that kind of the temporary use item so we didn't want to spread ourselves too wide and become um, the, the sort of platform of everything because we wanted to keep some kind of focus um, but that's where we kind of developed this idea of items for everyday family life um, and so that's what we have been busy doing. Um, and Lisa, if we can move on to the next slide. Uh, our purpose really is to create a, a, fa a community of families or a family of families. Um, because it's a two-sided marketplace, our community really is everything to us. Um, and the idea is that people in the community can share things that they use every day. Um, and you can rent locally from uh, your neighbours um, or if you're travelling somewhere, for example, if you're going up north for the weekend and anybody who's got children will know that travelling with kids, you've got to pack the buggy and the cot and um, the high chair and everything that goes goes with having small children. So potentially um, it could be easier just to, to borrow when you get there. Um, uh, the, the other reason for doing what we're doing is obviously um, the, the environmental reasons um, to step away from fast consumerism and to move to a more circular economy. Um, I had, you know, when I had my first son, I heard people saying, oh, I'm going on holiday. It's probably much easier for me just to buy a cheap buggy when I get there and then throw it away, which is, is awful, you know. So if we can, if we can put in place uh, something that is convenient and cheap and um, saves people disposing unnecessarily um, of items. And I think that's, that can only be a good thing. Um, it also gives people the opportunity um, to declutter um, while making financial savings and earnings. So um, for example, um, you might not want your baby's buggy sitting around for the next six months to lend it to a mum who does and um, that gets out of your way. It means that she's not having to buy one that equally is going to sit there for a long time after she's finished using it and um, create space for you and it, it makes some savings for her. So um, moving on to how the actual platform works. Uh, so we have been receiving um, great support from, from Zero Waste Scotland and Ricardo and um, v &A Dundee and we were, uh, went through the v &A, uh, Dundee Accelerator course um, and one of the things they suggested to us was um, the original idea was to build an app and that is still the long term plan. Um, but one of the things that came out of our Accelerator course was that we really need to test this concept first. Um, and we want to, you know, we need to do it in a kind of more efficient way than going out and um, incurring the expense of building an app. So what we have done is we have launched a beta website. Um, it's uh, mobile native, so um, same with Shida, it works very well on your um, mobile phone. Um, and we're currently promoting it in uh, Edinburgh and the Lothians. So because it's a beta trial, um, the website is pretty basic at the moment, but it does all the things that we need it to do to work. Um, and the point really of this trial is to get as many people using it as we possibly can um, to gather feedback and then use that feedback to build an app um, with all the features that the community would like to see it have. Um, so like I say, very simple to use. You go to the website, um, you create an account, uh, you'll then receive an email asking you to verify yourself via our third party verification uh, provider, Passspace. Um, verification is optional, but um, we encourage people to do it because it really helps to build trust in the community. People are much more likely to transact with you um, if they know that you've been through verification checks. Um, you then just go on to post a, limp, uh, post a listing um, at the top of the page. It's very simple to do, it takes less than a minute. Um, you select your rental category, um, what period you want to rent for. 
um, at the moment because it is uh, in beta trial um, you have to do separate listings if you want to offer kind of different periods because obviously you might want to price differently if you're lending something out for a month and if you're lending it out for a day. Um, you pop in the title price, the description and the location and your images and you click post listing and that's you, that's you all done. Uh, and Lisa, if you can just click this slide, it will bring up the next um, bit. So um, if you are searching for an item, what you do is you search by category, um, by keyword. So you can either search by category or you can search by keyword and you also search by location so that you can see where the items are. Um, you can then bring the results up in either a grid, uh, a grid sorry, on a list or on a map. Uh, and if we pop over to the next slide, you can you can see what happens next. Um, so the the borrower sees the item and a description of the, the item that the lender has provided. Um, they can also have a look at the lender's profile and see um, what rating they've been given by other users um, and what reviews have been left before. Um, and they can check all of that out before they go ahead um, and book the item. Um, and then I think if you click again, Louisa, um, the the uh, borrowers can also find, uh, as I said, more out about the lender through their ratings and their peer reviews. Um, and that for us is really just a really powerful way of building trust um, and it also encourages good service from the users of the platform if they know that they're going to get reviewed. Um, and it, it goes both ways. The lender can review the borrower and the borrower can review the lender. Um, before you go on to book, you can email the seller any questions you might have. Um, once you um, authorise your booking, um, we take payment at that point, but the, the, the payment sits, uh, uh, sits until the lender accepts or rejects the request. If the lender accepts the request, the funds are held um, by our third party uh, payment provider um, until the end of the transaction. Um, and that's just to give the borrower the opportunity if, you know, if they turn up and the item's broken or it's not in the condition that it, it looked, you, you know, it, looked um, it appeared on the website, then they have the opportunity to reject that and raise a dispute with us. And it means that we have the opportunity to, to refund their money. Um, at the end of the transaction, um, the borrower clicks complete and um, the lender receives payment. Um, and you can arrange how you want to do collection via message. So it's entirely up to the two parties how they want to collect. You can do drop, drop off or pick up. Um, I think so far everybody has collected and I think I imagine that will be the way that it goes going forward. Um, we also you also have the ability to request an item. So if there's something um, that you think, oh, I'd really like to borrow that, but it's not there. You can almost post a little advertisement and um, see whether anybody has it and would be willing to lend it to you. So that's something new that we've just introduced. So Louisa, if we can pop on to the next slide. Um, so this, uh, as I've said, we've you know launched our pilot um, in Edinburgh. It's, it's beta version, and we really are just in a period of learning. Um, we have had uh, we launched in uh, December last year, and since then we've had four hundred and fifty users signed up, um, and we're getting a, a fairly kind of a fairly frequent run of of transactions. The most popular being. Um, a carpet cleaner. Um, we were also featured on STV News, which was um, very exciting uh, for us. And I think, you know, it's it's helped in terms of our marketing just to add a, a little bit of legitimacy so uh, to our brand. Um, and if you are on, follow us on social media, you can pop on and watch our interview on STV News. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, Louisa. Um, as we said, the app itself is in development. We have had a prototype built, but we really want to prove the concept before we go ahead and build that. And we want to get feedback from the community that are using it because ultimately um, this is built for, for the community and there's no point in us running off and building what we think they want. We're better knowing what in fact they would like to see and putting that in place. So that's where we're at, we are at the moment. Um, like I said, we're receiving support from Zero Waste Scotland and Ricardo to develop our business and marketing plans. And at the moment, we are busy trying to uh, grow our community. Um, and just touching there on uh, something Naomi had said about um, uh, one of the things that we have learned also is that going too wide in terms of your marketing wasn't really working for us. I think these types of uh, sort of sharing ideas 
work really well when you do it from a, a local base. So we're kind of we're reviewing our marketing strategy at the moment and really focusing much more locally at the moment um, and then spreading, hopefully kind of spreading and growing out um, from there. Um, so how does this all fit into product as a service? Um, well, as Jess kind of touched on at the beginning, it's really all about access over ownership. So traditionally, if somebody had a dirty carpet, uh, what they thought they wanted, um, because this is what they've been told for many years through the power of advertising, is that they wanted to, or they wanted a carpet cleaner and specifically to own a carpet cleaner. Um, whereas what they actually want is a, a clean carpet. They, they don't really want a carpet cleaner. Um, so what we um, and many other um, rental businesses do, as we've heard, is provide access to, to that carpet cleaner to get the person to their ultimate goal of a clean carpet. Um, and it really does change the linear kind of buy, use, dispose model. Um, and it becomes much more circular rent and return. Or if you're on the other side of the marketplace, the buy, rent out, rent out, rent out model. Um, uh, and we, uh, I think the most kind of, uh, we've, we've seen this kind of established well with clothes, um, Shida, and I don't know if many of you seen recently, the Little Loop who specialise in children's clothes featured on Mar uh, Dragon's Den. Um, and there's been quite a lot of publicity around that. Um, I guess where our model differs from other rental um, uh, rental models is that we have decentralised and created a, a two-sided marketplace, so we don't actually hold any stock ourselves. Um, and that in turn um, creates its own challenges and upsides, um, and I'll come on and talk about that shortly. Um, but really for us, uh, product as a service is just about identifying people's needs and how they can be satisfied uh, in better ways that sort of reduces uh, fast consumerism. Um, when we started out, um, we hadn't we actually hadn't heard of the circular economy uh, and it's something that we've uh, learned a lot more about on our journey. Um, we're certainly not experts at this stage, but we're happy to share some of the, the lessons that we've learned in developing parent. Um, so moving on to some of those. Um, I, the key challenges, I think the primary one, and I think the primary one facing all product as a service model businesses is changing the mindset. So for us, the sharing economy, I would argue, is still in its relevant infancy in the UK. Probably your biggest peer-to-peer -peer sharing platforms are your likes of um, Airbnb uh, and by rotation uh, companies like that. Uh, and I think historically, Using secondhand things, certainly when I was at school, it was something that was quite stigmatised. And I, I, I think we have now come a long way where, where we're kind of at the point, I think we can say that secondhand items are commonplace uh, and accepted and are becoming much more popular because of the need to protect our planet and to protect the environment. Um, but where I think we need to get to, and I think we're slowly getting there, is where... Um, sustainable living and using um, secondhand items is not only commonplace and accepted but it's actually fashionable and the preferred option over buying new where you can um, but it is going to take some time to, to change that mindset but I definitely think um, we're on our way to doing it and I think part of the way that we can do that is to really hammer home some of the benefits so for us it's about you know helping the environment, helping your local community, making and saving money. Um, and for people to really see that it's convenient, I think, uh, you know, sometimes what people are put off by when they're looking at sustainable options is they think that they're, they're in some way going to be more inconvenient. But actually having somebody next door that you can borrow a last minute gazebo off of because you're having a party and it started raining is very convenient. It's more convenient than having to run to Asda and buy one. Um, so I think it's kind of hammering on hammering home those points. Um, and I think the other thing is it starting, as it's a sort of touched on earlier, at a community level and building out from there is the best way to start changing mindset. I, I, I've actually found that once people have started using the app, they've really, or the website, sorry, they've really started um, seeing the benefits and have encouraged friends to join up as well. Uh, a specific challenge for us, um, because it is a two-sided marketplace, um, we are not entirely in control, um, and that comes with its own issues. Um, I think the first one being, well, 
we don't have complete control over the customer service. So what happens if someone is failing to respond to inquiries? You know, there's somebody that desperately wants to borrow an item. They've emailed the lender. They can't uh, get a hold of them. Um, so thankfully, that hasn't happened often. It's, I can only think of one example since we, we launched. Um, and what we're doing at the moment is very carefully monitoring the, the transactions that are going through the website. Um, we were having issues for a while with mail going to junk. So we've been sort of manually checking and, and, and following up and making sure that if somebody is not getting replied to, we are going out of our way to source um, a, an, alternative, an alternative lend for them. Um, obviously, long term, that's not really scalable, but I think as the platform grows and as we're seeing more reviews um, on the platform, uh, uh, people will know who, the, who is likely to respond, who they're likely to be able to sort of, um, who's likely to come back to them. And if we're seeing people who are using the platform but um, not treating others in the way they should be, then we have the ability to take them off. So it's really just... Um, uh, finding ways uh, for us to sort of oversee and protect the community. Um, the other question that is uh, obviously comes up very often is what if somebody breaks uh, or steals my stuff? Um, so we've got very robust T's and C's in place. If you lend your stuff out and um, the borrower breaks it, then um, our terms and conditions say that generally they will be liable for the second-hand replacement value because it's a second-hand product that um, they are borrowing. Um, if there's a dispute about the value of that or a dispute about liability, then it can be referred to our dispute resolution service um, and we will make the ultimate decision on that. Um, we obviously have the verification, verification system in place to reduce any likelihood of um, theft or of people breaking items and then failing to follow up um, with their obligations. Um, we also have discretionary lender protection. Um, so if um, an item was broken and somebody was struggling to get their money back, um, we would um, step in. Um, long term, we hope to offer insurance. Uh, insurance is quite difficult to source in the sharing economy at the moment there are some small insurers um not small insurers but boutique insurers that are looking um at providing this type of thing because they can see how the sharing economy is growing and we are working um with one in particular at the moment so we hope long term to be able to offer insurance the other question is cleanliness how do we make sure the stuff is clean Again, because it's a two-sided marketplace, we can't physically be there, but we have um, robust T's and C's. The uh, borrower has the option to reject if they get there and the item that they were about to borrow is dirty. Um, and I, again, that can be referred to us if there's any dispute about that. And again, the, the reviews are there to, to build that trust. So hopefully before you um, go on to borrow something, you can, you can check how other users have rated the person you're borrowing off of and, and rated the cleanliness. Uh, how do we make sure the stuff is safe? Again, um, it's uh, our terms and conditions are robust. We have um, uh, terms in place to make sure that everything is in full working order and the lender needs to confirm that. Um, it needs to carry all the relevant safety marks. And we've excluded certain items like car seats and power tools um, that we just think are inherently sort of too, too dangerous for us to take on at the moment. And there are alternative um, product as a service companies out there that offer access to those. So there's the Edinburgh tool library that are great. And um, you know, if you're looking to borrow power tools, they are the place to go rather than us. And we also check the listings and we're, we'll remove anything that we're not happy with. So arguably um, renting off us, I, I would say we carry out more checks um, and it's a safer place to, to borrow from than you know, buying something from marketplace, for example, where these checks aren't carried out. Um, the other question that comes up a lot is why don't I just buy it second hand? Um, and in some in some aspects, some situations, that is definitely the more cost effective option. We don't see this as an alternative to, to buying second hand in all circumstances. Um, certainly, you know, if you're looking for a high chair for a year, you're probably better to go on to somewhere like Gumtree or Marketplace or any of your other um, second hand outlets and buy your chair there. Um, but there's lots of other reasons that you might want something short, short term. So, for example, one off use. So um, your carpet cleaners, your power washers, um, you want something last minute. So you're having a party, it started raining, you want to borrow a gazebo. 
you're traveling, so you don't want to carry the bulky items, you'd rather just buy them there. Or you're looking to buy an expensive um, piece of kit and you want to try it out before you buy it. Um, there's also your kind of medium term use items. So, for example, children, especially when they're babies, are usually only in something for a month or two. Examples being bouncers and jumperoos and that type of thing. Um, and finally, the biggest one of one of the biggest challenges for us is, is building the community um, and really getting ourselves noticed um, because we're so reliant on the two sides of our marketplace if people don't use us the idea simply doesn't work so it's it's really about about spreading the word um and making sure um people are aware and uh, you know keep being made aware and that the reviews that we're getting um, are, are good ones. So that's why we really go out of our way um, to take care of our community because our reputation uh, is everything really. Um, and if the community don't have trust in us, it doesn't work. Um, but we're certainly getting there. Like we say, we're growing from a, we're looking at a more sort of localized marketing strategy and growing out, outwards. And hopefully as the sort of sharing economy generally becomes more popular, it will become easier and easier to, to build that community. So finally, just moving on to um, our top tips, we would say um, do your market research uh, and do it again. We did lots of research before developing our service. The whole purpose of doing the trial is um, to make sure that we get lots of feedback. Um, we want to hear genuine feedback. We don't just want to hear people saying that it's great. We want to hear what can we do to make it better because ultimately this is a platform for the community and we want to provide the best service we can uh, to them. Know your the sort of your target audience. What are their ages? What are their incomes? Where do they like to shop? Importantly, where are they online? Because um, we're finding that the, the majority of our website traffic is coming from marketing that we're doing online. Um, the other thing is, is be adaptable. Um, the old saying, fail fast, fail cheap, um, and be prepared to pivot. So for example, we started out um, looking solely at baby equipment and it quickly became apparent that it, it needed to be something wider than that. We also started out with the idea that we wanted to go off and create this all singing, all dancing app, but we took on board that feedback and realized that actually starting with a beta trial was a far more um, cost-effective and efficient solution. Um, access the free support that's available. So the likes of Business Gateway um, and like I say, Zero Waste Scotland have been fabulous in their support for us um, and have fun. Um, you know, we, we've genuinely, yeah, genuinely loved um, what we've been doing um, and it, it really motivates us to sort of overcome the challenges and be creative and engage with others because we really enjoy what we do. And that's it. The only other thing I'd say is um, if you're interested in finding more, you can um, see at the bottom of all our slides, we've got our website. It's um, www.pa-rent.co.uk. Um, please do sign up, um, find us on social media, ask questions. We're very happy to answer them. Lovely. Thank you so much, Victoria. That's great. Right. Well, we've got a few minutes left for questions. So um, I'm just going to give people the opportunity to type any questions they might have into the chat function. So please, yeah, do take this opportunity um, if you have any burning questions or any yeah, thoughts about how you might personally go about this. Um, make the use of our panel um, that we have at the moment. Um, I have um, a few questions which I'd like to, to, to pose to some of you just to get us kick started. Um, I think the first one is for, for Jen, um, and it's a, about how your customers have reacted to the offer of product as a service. Have they taken a lot of convincing or have they thought actually yes that's that's a really good opportunity? Well what sort of questions have they come back with? Um, for ourselves I think it's it's one of those ones that everyone's everyone sees the benefit and it's really exciting. Um, but actually getting people uh, on board with the contractual elements um, has proved um, it's a big shift and it's a lot of um, influencers you have to talk to not at the sort of level that we're doing we're talking to the NHS, we're talking to Scottish Parliament, we're talking to large public and private bodies and, and prison service, when we're talking to these people, not one person will make this decision so um, we have to provide um, these kind of step up services as I was trying to kind of portray in my talk there of saying 
let us prove ourselves first. Let us remanufacture your lights. Let us um, go on a five-year contract model so we can maintain those, take the risk on, provide you with full warranties, show that we can do this. We can, we can not just provide you with new lights, but give you what looks like new lights, but at less cost. Because that's people believing that is a big part of the equation. Um, and then we just continue to talk to them through the strength of building relationships, which I and where sounds corny in some aspects, but a lot of it is trust. They have to trust that um, we will provide them with transparent costs. We'll show them where it is we're making our profits. Um, often that's to do with the fact that we're saving so much energy savings um, that we're able to take a share of that and we'll cover it. Um, but yeah, it's still, it's a journey, getting people on board, um, providing case studies for it. Um, and there's a lot of want in the industry. A lot of people I talk to want to be on this journey with us, but it's convincing everyone in the chain. Great. No, that, that's, that's a really great answer. And I think like you say, it's yes, providing that step up. It's perhaps not all at once. It's, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a journey to it. Um, so you're sort of easing, easing people in. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've had a question from uh, Vanessa, so I'm going to read it out. Um, if the product as a service business model is becoming increasingly popular, this means that private individuals will have much more recurring expenses instead of one-off larger expenses when buying a product. How do you think this will influence individuals' budget management in the long term? So thinking of, for example, times of reduced income, uh, when they might not be able to afford subscriptions anymore, but would benefit from previously purchased items. So I don't know if anyone on the panel has got any thoughts on that question. I think I'll leave that to the, the other two speakers <laughs> myself, because uh, they do much more kind of con direct to consumer models. Well, I guess... Um... <laughs> when you do have a, a sort of subscription-based model or um you know a model like ours where it's a buy as you need um that actually gives you some flex in your um in your financial planning in the sense that you you can you can stop a, a subscription um i think um or, or you know you can you can drop off sign up as and as and when you need it um uh, equally I mean in terms of our business model you could actually use the items that you I mean some items you will still continue to buy um, and you will continue to own and um, what we would say is well you would join the other side of the marketplace if you needed to make a bit of money why not rent one of your items out um, I mean that will not obviously apply to all product as a service um, models but certainly um, applies to ours so in some senses there is actually uh, more flexibility in terms of um, you know your, your cash flow and when you can stop up and restart and pick up a subscription and that type of thing and Naomi if you've got thoughts on this I suppose with your model you offer a, a range of different options so it could be one off but you also offer a subscription service as well so I suppose you're catering for both of those yeah exactly because we recognize that you know different people will want different things um and even with our subscription model um it's a cancel any time one so you know we unsurprisingly saw a drop off in January from people who are having to rein their, their finances in um, after Christmas. Um, I guess what I would you know the, the point there about um, thinking that actually they might have been better off having bought the stuff in the first place. Um, for us, it, again, it's about who we're targeting there. So the customers that we're targeting aren't people who are regularly um, buying from Reese and Hobbs and places like that. They're not buying investment pieces. They're buying cheap, fast fashion from places that are producing clothes in really horrific conditions. So for us, you know, it's not just about the financial cost of buying that. It's about the true cost in terms of cost to the environment, cost to human rights for the people that are making the clothes in the first place. So it, it may well turn out that they would have been as well financially. Uh, buying something from New Look and wearing that for a year, but I don't really make any apologies for offering a service that means that people are getting clothes in a way that's better for the environment and better for human rights. And also, the option to buy second hand as well, that's, that's still available. 
I, th I think as well, uh, the other thing to bear in mind is it's not intended to entirely replace buying, but often to sit alongside and complement it. So, for example, I've been looking at Shida this week and thinking, well, I would I would probably keep my own staple trousers because I, I know them and they, they suit my size. But actually, I quite like to change up the top. So, um, you know, you would keep your staples, you would buy your staples that you are going to use frequently. And the things that you rotate are the things that you use less frequently. Yeah, absolutely. And also in terms of budgeting side of things, again, you know, if people are seeing their costs suddenly decrease, if they've been used to a lifestyle where they can afford more expensive clothes, then, you know, renting something that's going to be much cheaper for them will mean that they can still, you know, turn up to an interview feeling dignified when they're struggling to get a job rather than turning up to an interview in cheap rubbish and seeing their competition absolutely bossing it in something amazing, which then instantly knocks their confidence and puts them on the back foot. Um, so I don't see it as being an issue. Thank you. And then one final question, and I think this one is for is for Jess, and it's I guess wondering what growth you've seen personally in product as a service in recent months or, or years. Oh, you. Want I think yeah. No, I think that we're really seeing kind of a huge growth. I think so. Product as a service has always been there. I think so. Sort of, I think as I mentioned, you know, the kind of leasing or renting cars or kind of renting tools. I think it's always been something, and perhaps something that was more commonplace you know, maybe in the 80s and sort of since sort of the 90s and kind of 2000s, we've kind of lost that. But I think that we're really seeing a kind of big growth. And I think almost in every sector, you're starting to see kind of product as a service models emerging. And I think, as I said, it's, you know, it's not just kind of startups that are kind of looking at this. You are seeing really established businesses and big kind of multinational kind of businesses are also looking at how they can kind of reconsider their business model and also looking at how they can offer product as a service. I think initially kind of alongside their kind of more traditional offering, but I think sort of more and more, we'll probably see kind of product as a service kind of being more mainstream for those kind of larger businesses as well. Lovely, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm aware that we have run over time. It always happens, um, but I just wanted to finish um, just by, following up with some Zero Waste Scotland support, just to recap on this very briefly, um, if you are interested in pursuing circular economy business models within your own organisation, then we do have some support mechanisms to, to help you look into that further. Um, first of all, our Circular Economy Accelerator website um, is a great resource full of case studies, um, resources, inspiration in order to yeah, help inspire you even more on this journey. Um, we have a circular economy business support service as well. So this is um, a free consultancy support service. Um, and many of the businesses that have spoken today have benefited from that in the past. So the purpose of this service is to help fill any gaps in expertise or knowledge that you might have in particular circular um, products or services that you wish to pursue. So if you're interested in this service, please get in contact with me. Um, I also thought it was worth mentioning um, the Social Enterprise Net Zero Transition Fund. So this is a fund that has been launched very recently um, between ourselves and Social Investment Scotland. Um, this is a fund specifically for social enterprises, so it won't be relevant to everyone, um, but it's designed to support social enterprises and the third sector to make the transition to carbon net zero. So it offers a loan and also a small grant um, to help with the purchase of um, particular solutions to facilitate a movement to the circular economy. So yeah, please check out the, the web link there if you're interested in looking into that further. Uh, we run a, a range of training and um, webinar opportunities through um, Zero Waste Scotland. Uh, it's worth noting that there is a Green Champions training uh, session coming up on Wednesday the 30th of March. Um, and with regards to circular economy, we have a Kickstarter workshop. So we run these on a quarterly basis and the next one is on the 8th of June. So this circular economy Kickstarter session um, is a really useful overview of what the circular, is, circular economy is, what the nine different strategies are um, and provides you with yet more case studies in Scotland of all these different strategies um, and next steps to take. So if you're interested in either of those events, then please visit the Zero Waste Scotland Eventbrite page and it'll take you to registration links. 
but yeah well, we'll finish there thank you so much to our speakers for joining us today um, and for giving such a, a great overview of product as a service it's been really inspirational uh, and thank you very much to everyone for joining us sorry for running slightly over but please enjoy the rest of your day thank you goodbye Bye. 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 Bye.